to thank you all for attending the first National Women Transforming Cities Conference. We were really pleased to have counselors from coast to coast to coast. We had the diversity that we hoped in terms of both the elected union representation, women's organizations, individuals, youth, and urbanists here today. We sold out the conference. We had over 150 people signed up. We know next year that, next year perhaps, we will need to do a conference on the weekend because we've had some youth in particular say they couldn't attend and that they wanted to come. We'd like to say that we feel that we've met our objectives of really hearing some of the most critical and pressing issues facing women and girls across Canada, even though this is this uh, Women Transforming City so far is mostly based in the Lower Mainland. We're hold, hearing more and more that the situation for women and girls is getting worse, from funding cup, cuts from provincial, federal, and local levels of government, to cuts to public service, increasing violence, uh, lack of affordable housing, the need for childcare, the need to address violence, racism, the need to design neighborhoods for women and girls, the need to address transit. We are going to write up the proceedings that are presented to us in the next few minutes and they will put, be put on our website so that they can go forward to the FCM, that you can take them forward to your local organizations and to your councils. We want to work with you. So this is just a beginning. It's been a powerful, powerful day and as one of the speakers said earlier, we want to lift the fog we want to speak out, we want to fight back, and we need organizations through which we can do that. And Women in Cities is a group of committed women and men who are supporting us to do that. So thank you so much for being here. I'd like to turn over the rest of the proceedings for right now to Diana Young, who sits on the Steering Committee Board of Women Transforming Cities. Diana is doing her graduate work in counseling and community psych psychology at the Adler School of Professional Psychology which has provided women transforming cities with some outstanding volunteers. Diana's focus is on social determinants of health and mental health promotion. And she, as she says, has been working behind the scenes of women transforming cities for the past two years and will be co-hosting this session. Diana. Thank you, Ellen. Um, just to start off, I'd like to get um, Jen and Anastasia to come up and present the um, what was discussed in your panel. is mind-blowing. We are deconstructing the whole system. So you can get a sense what it was like. If you were there, hopefully um, you enjoyed it as well. So uh, we had a... Session for you, housing? Uh, was the young woman take charge? Thank you. Yeah. Point. So we started the session with a presentation from uh, Rebecca Mahaffey from uh, the city of Burnaby. Beach. She is uh, with the planning department who uh, basically presented on uh, some of the things that Burnaby was doing, and uh, it opened up a really great conversation. So we're going to go very briefly about some of the recommendations that were put forward as a result of it, and also contextualize it a little bit as we go. So one of the first things that I would like to acknowledge, and the fact, uh, the thing that we arrived at somewhere in midway, is that it is intimidating being women in the city governance and politics, no matter what age you are. 
It is especially difficult for younger women, but even elected officials who are women acknowledge the fact that they're often outnumbered by men in the room when they come in as new members of the city council or other groups with less experience, it is an intimidating experience for them as well. So we were able to establish this intergenerational kind of common ground from which I think it's really important to work with and acknowledge how we can support each other through this. Um, so um, we kind of looked at several levels of engagement and we were talking about youth engagement and young women specifically. So the very first kind of uh, base layer is engaging youth in general. And um, because obviously there's recognition that uh, municipalities often struggle with engaging youth, and there is not, not a single program that we are aware of that would focus specifically on young women uh, through those efforts. So we were, look, uh, we were talking about the fact that education about how to be civically engaged needs to start happening as early as possible. And when we say as early as possible, it's not high school, it's not even elementary level school, all the way to kindergarten. And there was an excellent example from Saskatoon, uh, from one of the um, participants, where there was um, consultation with uh, three, four, five, six year old with toddlers, when they were given options about how to um, design and plan a certain part of the city, and they were actually voting on it. So things like this are happening, and it is amazing and incredible. So you, if you get toddlers to be participating in those <laughs> processes in a meaningful way early enough, everything is possible. Um, another point that was made that we need to make a bridge between institutions, because there are often very strong leadership programs in schools where a lot of young women are involved, but something happens when they transfer to university level or they enter the workforce, because this kind of association with a certain institution seems to be creating a barrier when they try to transfer into something else. Yeah, there, se there seems to be a disconnect between generations and in terms of how we address and acknowledge those generational voices that often are missing. And I also just kind of want to acknowledge first that we did have a second speaker and her name was Milam. Um, unfortunately, she wasn't able to make the <coughs> panel discussion today. And when we first were thinking about ways of how to design an ideal city for women and young girls, we're like, well, if we're doing a youth panel, why aren't we including youth voices? So we reached out to Milam, who is a proud youth who does a lot of youth active work, um, and was unable to make it for whatever reason that may be. And I thought that was just a really poignant reflection of how spaces are made accessible or inaccessible to youth to show up, uh, for youth to occupy those spaces, for youth to even raise their voices or feel validated or acknowledge in those spaces. Um, she could have not been here for whatever reason, right? It could have just been a bad day or transportation, whatever those things may be. But I think it's very interesting that um, that was an example of exactly what we were talking about today in the panel. Thank you. Uh, so some of the other recommendations that came out um, addressing the barriers such as the accessibility of the spaces and also often a lack of <coughs> knowledge of how the system works, what is the language that is being used, how um, you know the formalized structure of many of the proceedings and gatherings where youth are invited to participate but still become an accessible because of their structures. So acknowledging the fact that youth are also busy and for them to be able to participate in those processes, it has to be an ongoing engagement, maybe shorter sessions but more frequent and not as something that is you know, a transplant, someone coming to the classroom once, for example, or a token youth being invited to a city council once or twice. It has to be an ongoing engagement. Um, another thing that was brought up is the importance of facilitating youth organizing among themselves because this helps to bridge between the institutions, that helps to promote long-term engagement. And when youth come together and organize among themselves with the support and the resources, they accomplish amazing things. And this is, those are the things that we want to nurture and support and provide mentorship when needed. Um, one other very important point on this note is to acknowledge the youth the expertise that you have and their leadership that all, that is already there and that they can provide not just to other youth but to all other former youth, which was a <laughs> fabulous concept. Uh, Ex-youth is what they said. Ex-youth, that's right. And really treating youth as a resource and acknowledge their 
the, the fact that they do have important things to say, and young women in particular, and they should not be tra treated just as a token because they do care about the issues. Many of them are actively engaged already, and it's a matter of identifying how to tap into that. One of the points that was made that many young women are very uh, active in the social media, in online activism, online civic engagement. So those are the things that also need to be tapped to, into and explored. And you know, if the fact is, if um, if you're consult, if you're conducting public consultations on certain certain issues when designing the city, it might be difficult for youth to attend a meeting. But how about bringing those consultations online and tapping into the networks and community groups that are already doing those work, and supporting both you know your traditional leaders and non-traditional leaders, and reaching them out in alternative ways and utilizing the resources that already exist in the community and work collaboratively on that. So we do have one minute, um, but we finally we do want to uh, say that it's, it, as we talked about in terms of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, leadership and learning and interaction, it really, the underlying thing is to challenge those kind of top-down hierarchies that is often established in dominant spaces and, and structures. So in terms of infrastructure, how are spaces set up, those are often things that we need to really consider in terms of who's the voices of expertise and who's the one who's receiving those acts, right? Um, so that those things are happening on a lateral uh, landscape. And the last sort of, oh, there's two kind of major recommendations um, is around recognition is to have civic youth awards. Um, and the, probably the outstanding uh, recommendation that uh, was brought up was lowering municipal voting age to 16. Yeah. I'd like to thank both of you very much and we're proud that uh, both of you are working on the steering committee of Women Transforming Cities. Um, Janet Wiegand should be really acknowledged for her tremendous work with Equal Voice, getting women to the gate and many other uh, things that they've done in terms of um, letting people know about the situation of women in politics in Canada. She's going to present the information from the panel Designing Safer Cities for Women. Thanks, Janet. I'll just say one more thing. Erica laid the theoretical framework, if you will, and Berinder gave the examples. And if you want to hear some amazing examples of what Surrey is doing to address safety and women and girls, talk to her. It's on the website, too. It's on the website, too. Okay. Surrey.ca. So we're proposing that the recommendation be to initiate a pilot in 20 cities across Canada, two per province, and the point uh, with, in partnership with girls and women from organizations involving local universities, accessing women and girls through libraries, this was Berinder's recommendation, 
um, anti-violence groups because they know a lot about this area, uh, community health nurses, making sure we include older women, refugees and immigrant groups. Berinder makes a practice of going to visit with refugee groups in Surrey once a year. So she goes to them, is her point. Um, young women and more as identified in your group. So those would be the stakeholders who would be involved and this is what you'd be doing. You'd be collecting data and recommendations. So can everybody see? I think you can. Um, the first thing would be to collect data from police. Not everybody reports incidents, so then you can go to anti-violence groups who also have usually different kinds of data. You can also do some surveying to get anecdotal uh, information about issues for women and girls around safety. And then you can prepare a city map of violence against women and girls. And so, Erica, maybe you could just stand up and wave your hands if anybody wanted to know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I think you have examples. So I think that's a great concept. And Vancouver's been doing something similar with um, things like where people have heart attacks and therefore where to put the defibrillator ma uh, machines, which I, I think is a great idea. So the second part is that you analyze best opportunities and then you implement them. And so one way to do this is to bring people together in cafes or um, use social media, but also engage people in, in person and get their ideas based on the, the data, the science, and anecdotal stories of what they could do about it. Um, you would identify the top priorities and find out how much that might cost you to implement, bring that to your council for approval. And then we ask you to report out at next year's 2014 FCM gathering. Okay, so now I'm gonna cover off a few themes. So I just wanna highlight three of the themes. One is infrastructure, it's things like lighting, parkades, um, parks. Those are ways that uh, communities have done safety audits and then identified where the highest risk areas were and took measures to reduce the risk. Uh, gender awareness education. I'm gonna give you some excellent examples of educational campaigns targeting uh, boys and girls primarily, but the entire population as well as women. And uh, access. So some of the examples that Brenda gave were things like having um, pamphlets on services translated into 11 different languages. She's going out to the groups and meeting with them. Um, those are the only ones I can read from here. So examples of good practices. Someone raised the issue of uh, an issue that seems to be I, saw, I read about it in the media um, with cab, some cab drivers sexually assaulting women. And so Berinda pointed out that <coughs> municipalities have the authority to uh, revoke chauffeur licenses for complaints. So that was an interesting strategy. And then on the educational campaign front, um, you have the Be More Than a Bystander campaign that's currently underway in British Columbia between Ending Violence Association of BC and the BC Lions, and it's engaging football players to, they go out in the schools and they have ads that have run in Surrey and Vancouver, uh, and across media, television, radio, that engage men and boys to stand up against violence against women and girls. Rocky bracelets, I won't go through them all, but Rocky bracelets Brenda described are when sisters give their brothers a purple bracelet and their brothers wear those bracelets and it's a statement on the part of the brothers that they don't condone violence against women. Three minutes, thanks. And ca another interesting example from Toronto, a counselor speaking to the media and a woman was, a counselor was approached about, well, you know, there's been some cases of attacks against women and they shouldn't be running out in the parks at night. And her response was, well, actually, it's the men who shouldn't be uh, assaulting them, and we need to think about ways of engaging men to tell them that this kind of behavior is not right. So I thought those were excellent examples. 
Am I missing any major ones from our session? Outreach. Outreach is in there. Okay, well, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. This is our recommendation then, the pilot for 20 um, cities to take this on, and we hope you will take that forward to the FCM. Thanks. Um, and she'll be talking about on the streets where we live, housing rights, and city-based solutions for women and girls. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I want to thank all the hard work that we've all been doing all day long. Um, our session this morning was, was fabulous, and um, I don't have a plug-in for my little thing here or anything. But I'm just going to give you the summary of, of the points that we made this morning that, that, um, that we prioritized. So we came up with um, three categories of recommendations. Uh, the first one, um, and again, this is all about um, housing. The first one is that research is needed. Um, we need data to back up. Um, our points and, and our, our recommendations. Um, that's one way of convincing um, those with power to, to act. Um, so the types of research um, that's, that we thought would, would be um, most useful is um, a gendered enhancement of the notion of homelessness. So um, at the moment, uh, a lot of uh, the the sketching in of what homelessness looks like is um, gender neutral, um, which often comes out as male. And, and as we spoke of, or not we, but um, some of the speakers earlier spoke of the invisibility of um, women who are homeless because they have a different trajectory concerning their homelessness. Um, this, is, this is a really important point. Um, another uh, point uh, for research needed is to enhance the definitions of affordability and adequacy. So looking at what we mean by um, what is affordable housing and what we mean by what is adequate housing. Uh, I, I think that perhaps um, the people who, um, and particularly the women and girls who are given or offered um, affordable housing or adequate housing um, may not think that the housing they're being offered is either for affordable or adequate. Um, uh, the other uh, research point that we had was um, to research best practices regarding public and social housing, and um, I have some examples of that below um, under another section. So the second category of, um, the, of, of themes that we, we talked about and prioritized today were, were, was the subject of messaging. And um, by messaging, we mean how um, uh, the, the parameters and understandings of, of housing um, go out to the public and actually are absorbed by the people who um, uh, are housed. Um, so, so one of the examples that came up was the idea of that, that taxes are good and government is good, um, um, and that, that uh, because of course we need taxes, we need a funding base in order to um, pay for um, housing, and um, often the, I think this came up, this came up in a, um, another context today that I was listening to, talking about how um, individuals have, have such a, 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 a Big role to play in in taking action um, for their for their own well-being, um, but actually governments need to play a, a, a role. I mean, um, oh, women and girls can't create housing for themselves. Nece you know, not necessarily anyway. They they, they may, but um, a lot of the, the affordable housing issues that we're talking about, we're not talking about people who can go out and. Um, buy land and build, use the bricks and mortar to create roofs over their heads. 
Um, so another messaging point is um, that social housing is good, and that it, again comes up as a question because there's this nimbyism issue of people not wanting social housing in their neighborhood. There's this, there, there um, can be ideas that a social housing, um, you know, looks bad, is you know, is brings property values down and all that, and and that doesn't need to be the case. In fact, um, I had one thing I'm not looking. I didn't even see the person. Um, <laughs> oh, fuck. oh, thank you. Okay, so the last, uh, the last category is programs and legislation. Um, so we need a national housing, a national and regional housing strategy, absolutely. Um, we need enhanced um, or re-invoked uh, residential tenancy acts. We need um, guaranteed um, living incomes. Um, their specific recommendations included rent banks, um, non-profit P3s, um, demolition controls, tax relief for non-profit housing, um, leverage, leveraging developers, so um, give, um, um, making profit margins smaller and increasing um, low income housing and amenities. We wanted um, some of the recommendations included co-op housing, family housing, vacancy tax, and, and of course, we wanted um, women and girls to be more involved in decision making and design processes. Again, not burdening the responsibility onto women and girls, but um, ensuring, ensuring agency within um, the whole rubric um, of, of housing and, and, and homelessness. So that's it. I think I went over time. Sorry. Thanks very much. I just feel like everyone's sagging from the thought of all this unpaid work. <laughs> so all the remaining speakers have to tell a joke and tell us why what we're going to do is going to be so uplifting. <laughs> the next speaker is Prabha Costa, who's going to talk about putting a gender equity lens on environmental sustainability. She's an internationally renowned writer and researcher and speaker. And her. Google her. It's quite stunning. <laughs> We have two speakers and we had um, a very free-flowing conversation, a lot of which really focused at um, actions at the local level, at community level, um, not even at a municipal local level. So um, three of us did a synthesis of key points and I, that's what I will share with you. So. Um, yeah. Municipal, um, environmental, and sustainable development policies should be informed by gender equality and social justice principles. Um, women in communities, neighborhoods, private sector, virtual communities, age-specific communities, cultural communities should shape consultations um, at the municipal level. And I think this is coming from that the municipality should not be the only one shaping what public consultations um, can be or should be or look like, but that um, these various constituencies can also shape what, what they should be, and that through this process and accountability of local government to citizens. Um, that local initiatives are important, um, and some of the examples were community gardens, bartering systems, access to food, uh, recycling, and that municipalities need to support women's initiatives on the ground. That, and so really it's a broader definition of environment and it's also looking at food security. Um, there should be more public education, uh, both about the built and the natural environment. Um, and that's in a broader way, but also specifically through the school systems, as per the example from Halifax. Um, there was some discussion about public spaces, and um, it was sort of broad, so we, we weren't totally sure how to bring it to some shape here, but we talked about the need to enhance, or to, to look at public spaces as a way to enhance community building. Um, but that really to shape it also in a way that enables that to happen, which is the changing urban design um, of neighborhoods and homes. Um, the need for safety for women and girls um, in public spaces, 
and also the need to connect public spaces via social media, and I think that's sort of common to living in bigger cities. Thank you. Did I miss something that, do people from my group want to mention anything that I might have missed? Because there was a lot of comments. I think there were some comments that a lot of action took place at a local level, but, at a, but that addressing some of the environmental issues, you have to think at the earth level and the gap between the two uh, and how to address, you know, how to think about it systemically. And women's characteristics, you know, women can bring compassion to these areas and change the values. Mm -hmm. Fine. And I think also some mention of the role of the state, right? Yes. In and more environmental accountability. And political action to put pressure there. Right. Thank you. Any, anyone else? There was a lot said in the group. Thank you. Thank you, Prabha. I know it's hard to summarize an hour and a half into eight minutes, so <laughs> well done. Um, so where is Wendy? Oh, there you are. Um, I'd like to ask Wendy Williams to come up to the stage. She is the chair of the City of Vancouver's Women's Advisory Committee. Um, and she's the co-chair of <coughs> Women Transforming Cities, and she is also a very fabulous woman. <laughs> so I learned a new trick today, and I've already forgotten the woman's name who's from Quebec. So when? Oh, there she is down there. So this woman down there in the stripes, and your first name is? Bonnie. Bonnie. So when I start a meeting, everybody has to introduce themselves and say why you're fabulous. So I pointed out I was feeling really guilty that everyone was going to do that. So she pointed out we could all do it in one second. So I'm going to go one, two, three, and you're going to shout out about yourself what's fabulous. <laughs> so it's a way of acknowledging that I only work with fabulous people. So you got that? All right. So one, two, three. Thank you. So, now, keeping up the tradition. Okay. So, ours was about inclusion. Ours was about a process of how we work together and how we are going to work together. So, it's not really recommendations for others. It was sharing our experiences of what we've done to include other people. So we had a fabulous, uh, as you know, fabulous people, uh, a speaker, one woman, Jessie Hempel, who is a city councillor in the Port Hardy, talked about her experience in planning and how that she does that. Dr. Shelley Johnson, she gave us some history of Aboriginal experience in Canada and how important it was to know that and how most of us acknowledged how little of that we know. Judith Marcuse spoke to us about using uh, art as a way of engaging. A lucky Gill gave her examples of work that she's done from her heart based on feeling grateful for Canada and her work with Global Girl Power um, to do things. So they talked about different things. They talked about uh, safe environments. They talked about going where people are. They talked about taking um, uh, not just calling up people, but actually going to visit. You know how you used to bring food and bring to a neighbor? I'm big on having food at meetings, as anybody knows me. So we talked about some of those processes of what we've done in our practice. We shared ideas back and forth, business cards, how to meet with different problems. And we all acknowledged it takes time, it takes a lot of time, it takes work, and it takes commitment, and it takes a safe space where people feel safe enough to talk about their experience and bring it to the table. I have four pages of notes, which, you know, at some point, I guess we'll write them up, um, and they'll go on our website. So those are the ideas, you know, similar things to what people said, coffee houses, go to where the people are, have food at the meetings, short meetings, many times of the year, uh, that people have all used. Child care. Child care. Providing issues for child care. Having children welcome at meetings. Um, those types. So lots of ideas and uh, lots of uh, experiences. And uh, there was a lot of energy in our room 
a lot of people when they spoke were uh, had a lot of emotion. They got choked up, and um, safety seems to me in the background of, of a lot of our work that we do. And um, uh, thanks everybody for coming. Any other comments? Presenter is Chris Morrissey. Chris is chair of the LGBT, the Seniors Advisory Committee at the City of Vancouver, works with Rainbow Refugee and Legit on um, issues of uh, LGBTQ immigrants and refugee issues. And she's presenting on innovation implementation of an equity lens. Thank you, Chris. speakers on four different, uh, giving, giving examples of four different innovative, uh, innovative ways in which women uh, have participate and, and create uh, ideal cities. So uh, we had uh, Kristen Wong Tam, who is a counselor with uh, the City of Toronto. We had Linda Solomon, who's the founder and editor-in-chief of the Vancouver Observer. We had Rita Chudnowski, who is with the Coalition for the Child Care Advocates. And our last speaker was Angela Marie McDougall, who's with Battered Women Support Services and the February 14th uh, Memorial March in the downtown east side of Vancouver. So, um, <coughs> We have a, a varied list of recommendations and we didn't really have time to prioritize. I did try to push people to be very concrete in terms of their recommendations and also to bear in mind that, um, that this is the work that all of us have to do and that uh, we, we do have this, uh, this mechanism or whatever of women transforming cities but we each go back to our own communities and the places where we live and it's up to us to network with other women who have been here and other women who maybe have not been able to be here in order to actually bring about some of the changes that we've been talking about. So uh, one recommendation was that women transforming cities provide a training on gender and equity to local councils. So it's a question of going directly to city councils and um, providing them with an education on what it looks like to have a gender equity diversity lens. Uh, there was one suggestion that's very local to Vancouver. Uh, in Vancouver there is a movement to uh, build a new uh, art gallery and so somebody suggested that the old art gallery, the recommendation is that the old art gallery become a hub, a women's hub, right in the center of downtown Vancouver. <laughs> that they're similar to something that one or two other committees, uh, discussion groups pointed out, the issue, there's an issue of safety for women and women and girls and, and boys, particularly in, in recreational areas, uh, looking at parks where people, the, that people walk through, looking at bike routes, uh, and the need for appropriate lighting and the need to have those become, uh, become more safe so that people can actually, women can actually use them. There is a fairly big movement in, in the lower mainland to create more greenways but the greenways are no use if they're not adequately lit and adequately patrolled. So uh, I guess different people can go back to their different parks boards, um, if you have them, and bring forward these issues and concerns to the parks board. Uh, 
Oh yes, there was a, a recommendation that we have a women's equality office in each municipality so that that particular municipal office would then uh, assist the, the council and presumably staff in putting uh, an equity lens on policies and processes that they're, uh, that they're bringing forward. And finally, well not finally, that uh, the recommendation for the $10 a day childcare uh, be brought forward to the FCM um, to get that whole plan endorsed because there is a plan that's already been developed and is already to be, is ready to be in, in, endorsed. And the final one here, which sort of fits with many of the things that we've been talking about, is to request that the FCM uh, embed a gender equity lens on, in all municipal work. And I would like to add that, that, that we're looking at an equity lens, whether we're looking at it, I know this is about women, but you know there is an extension of this to to women, to LGBT people, to new immigrants, to refugees, many of whom are also women. So um, it, we're looking at having uh, having a diversity. This is me, not what the group said. We're looking at, <laughs> just so you know, we're looking at we're lo the, the group said we want to have uh, a gender equity lens. I'm just pushing it a little bit further. Oh yes, yes, and and this weekend at the uh, the city councilors should take this forward to the um, to the FCM. Yes, those are our recommendations. So as as a <coughs> final word, as a person who does a lot of organizing, and a person who has sat in many organizations and committees and I've heard many people say, this should be done, that should be done, they should do this, they should do that. I'd like to change the discourse, it is we will do. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Chris. Um, so before I close up the conference and just uh, make a few final announcements, Ellen asked me to share with you um, my experiences with women transforming cities. Uh, so I'm a young woman, I like to think so anyways. Uh, last week my two-year-old neighbor asked me if I was a grandmother. Um, I, I, I'm still not, I don't know. I don't know, I don't, I don't know. Um, so anyways, I'm not a grandmother or a mother, if that was a question. Um, so when Ellen first asked me to um, be on the plenary with her and help close up the conference, I was a little bit resistant. Um, I usually am when she asks me to do things. Um, but, you know, so the questions I asked were first, like, what, what's a plenary? And then it was, why me? Uh, she never really gave me an answer to what a plenary was, um, but in terms of why she wanted me up here, it was simply stated as, because Dana, you're a young, fabulous woman, and you speak from the heart. And you can't really argue with that, so here I am. <laughs> um, there you go. So the more I thought about it, though, um, the more symbolic it became to me, and I actually had an epiphany at like 2 o'clock in the morning last night, that I've actually come full circle. Uh, two years ago, I walked into Ellen's office as a practicum student from the Adler School of Psychology. Um, I had no idea what I had gotten myself into, and um, if for those who were around back then, I was a bit wide-eyed and a little bit scared, um, walking by the portraits of the Prime Minister and the Mayor and the, all the past mayors of Vancouver. It was a little bit intimidating for a young woman um, who had never been to Vancouver City Hall before. Um, but what I've realized is that I had stumbled onto an opportunity um, to be mentored by and to work with some really fabulous women. Um, and I'm incredibly grateful for that. It also turned out to be a launching point for me um, to gain new experiences, like talking in front of an audience when 
we weren't really hoping to do that. Um, but yeah, good for new experiences, right? Um, anyway, so like I said, um, starting with Ellen, uh, working with her then, and then kind of coming full circle and closing has been really special to me. So I thank you for that. Um, so just, um, oh, this is a good segue. So because I had such good experiences with women transforming cities, I encourage everyone else to get involved as well. Um, <laughs> No, in all, in all seriousness, no. It is a great organization. Um, we encourage you to join. Um, you can come to or co-host our monthly cafes that are held all over the Lower Mainland. Um, we have one coming up in June and then are taking a bit of a break for the summer. Um, we have um, other ways to get involved. You can um, send us an email and we can sign you up for our, our newsletters. Um, we have monthly meetings at city halls and speaker series, uh, the cafes, which I mentioned, um, and we're also talking about having future conferences. And we'll also continue to work with the best practice awards. Um, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge and thank all the organiza organizations who submitted entries um, for the best practice awards. Yeah, your work is really inspiring. And it gives um, women transforming cities and women everywhere something to work forward to. Okay. And I think that was it. Did I miss anything? All right. So. Okay. So while this is the end of the conference, there's still a lot more work to be done. Um, there are some very rich and powerful conversations that took place here today. Um, the recommendations that you've all come up with will be written up in a report and brought forward to the FCM, as was mentioned earlier. Um, they'll also be made available on the website and be shared with the city officials who were represented here today. So on behalf of WTC, we'd like to thank all our sponsors whose generous support made this event possible. So the City of Vancouver, the Department of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies from Simon Fraser University, um, the Canadian Union of Public Employees, the Justice Education Society, QP Metropolitan Vancouver, Vancouver District Council, the Housing Justice Society, the Vancouver and District Labor Council, the Georgia Strait and South Asian Magazine. We would also like to thank all our wonderful speakers and acknowledge the volunteers whose dedication and work have made this conference a huge success. Um, finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Women Transforming Cities leadership, uh, past and present. It's because of your commitment and passion um, that the vision of having a national conference was able to become a reality, um, and for that, I think everyone here is grateful. I just want to say it's been a pleasure to work with another fabulous woman from the steering committee of Women Transforming Cities. And just an aside, her uncle was the first Chinese member of parliament in Canada, and she's following well in his footprints and steps, I think. Okay, so my first thought wasn't what is a plenary, it was actually Ellen is trying to groom me for politics again. <laughs>